let us open in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time here together tonight, for the opportunity to be here among brothers to hear your word. And Lord, I pray you open our hearts, our minds, our ears to hear what you have to say and that anything that is confusing and from our flesh, let it be set aside and anything from the enemy, you will keep far from this place because this is your house and we thank you, Lord. We pray in the name and in the power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. All righty. Do we need to close the door? <laughs> so who's playing in the hall? All right. We are in Acts 10, first part. So let's read verses 1 through 8 of Acts 10 together. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Okay, and these verses were introduced to Cornelius the centurion. And because I love military history, you're going to get bored with a few facts about that now. But you probably have heard that a centurion is an officer over 100 men, and that's correct. And at this time in history, which is between about 104 B.C. and 200 A.D., that was the operational level unit. That was the, the unit that had a staff for the top-ranking officer, which was the centurion. Uh, the Roman military unit, the one we hear most about, is a legion. And that was, again, that changed some during, at different times, but during this time, that was a body of five to 6,000 men, and it consisted of, it was broken down into 10 cohorts. And it would be very much like, although bigger than say the American Civil War time, you'd have 10, 10 to 12 companies, but the cohorts were larger than a company, but those would be broken down into six of the centuries. So you'd have a cohort made up of six centuries of 100 men each. The commander of the first century of the first cohort, that was the, that would be like saying now, first brigade, first company, uh, was called the Primus Pil Pil I can't say it, Pilus, which is the first spear, and it's kind of a cool name, and they commanded both the co cohort and, well, they commanded the whole, co whole uh, cohort as well as their century. So that was sort of the equivalent of, the uh, closest thing today would be a company commander, and that would have the rank and their rank would be a range, just like it would be today, but it could be anything from second lieutenant to a major, might be the equivalent of a centurion at that time. Roman legions were the elite heavy infantry of Rome, and they were almost exclusively made up of Roman citizens. So that was, that had just fairly recently become the case and those that had fought for Rome for a long time were made citizens. Now, most of them were Italians, and they were the ones that were very dedicated and you know, the, the elite troops of that time. So a centurion would be a Roman citizen, and he was invariably a man 
of integrity and of courage. Anytime we hear about a centurion, this is a man that would command and have considerable respect in his time. And you got all that at no extra charge because I love military stuff, but I got carried away in it. But Cornelius, Cornelius is one of seven centurions that I found mentioned in the Bible. Uh, Julius was the other one that was actually mentioned by name, and he was the one that transported Paul to Rome and was with him for that most of that trip in Acts 27 and 28. And while these are named, there are at least five others that are mentioned. And you know, Romans were despised by the Hebrews. They were conquerors, they were occupiers, not popular people in Israel. But it, so it's interesting to note that every single reference to a centurion in the Bible is a positive one. They're always referred to favorably. Even when they're doing things like transporting Paul as a prisoner, you know, they are listening and caring for their charges. So men of integrity. Uh, probably my favorite one is, we don't know his name, is the one who asked Jesus to heal his servant. And uh, he received really one of Jesus' greatest compliments in the Bible. He said, assuredly I say to you, I have now found not such great a faith in all of Israel. And... Uh, and actually, three of the other centurions that were mentioned were part of being prisoners of Paul, or that Paul was a prisoner of theirs at different times. But all of them treated him with respect. They protected him, and actually, in at least one case, saved his life, and took care of Paul as being someone under their charge. Well, Cornelius is a good example of a great leader there. He's a devout man who feared God with all of his household, so those under him shared his beliefs. And he gave alms generously to the people, so he's generous, and he prayed to God always, which sort of brings us to mind the pray at all times that we have as a commandment there. He was not a Jew. Uh, the fact that he's called a lover of God uh, shows, or God-fearer, excuse me. I'm getting into Theophilus now. But <laughs> that, that he was called in here a, a God-fearer shows that he wasn't a proselyte, not someone that had converted to Judaism, which he had to do through circumcision, which would be enough to discourage most of us, I think. But you had to be circumcised. You had to be ceremonially washed in the mikvah and you had to I believe give a sacrifice and I don't didn't find the definition of what that sacrifice might be but it was a big deal to convert to Judaism but there were a lot of people that believed in the God of Abraham that were not Jews and this man was one of them in verse 3 we see he's a man of prayer and by praying in the ninth hour, which is about three in the afternoon, that was a time that was ritually observed by Jews to pray to God. So he was observing the Jewish faith while not having converted. Probably. I mean, that might just be a coincidence that it was that time of day, but that was a time of ritual prayer. God is responding to his prayers because he is a man who is seeking God, and he honors him with both his time and his possessions. It's not because Cornelius was a devoted, a devoted Jew. He almost certainly was not. And it's not because he was in the position of you know, winning the God lottery for that week. Oh, it almost sounds like it the way that is presented, but that's not how God operates. If you read verse 4, it's, God saw you, yay, but God sees us all, so we have to look at different ways to interpret that, and, that's, and that really is a matter of he was exceeding others in doing things that 
showed his devotion to God. Let's say God sees Cornelius' heart, he sees his action, his devotion, and that his whole household is aware, and God wants him to hear the gospel, and that's what this is about. Cornelius has a heart that is prepared to receive the gospel. So in a very miraculous way, an angel appears to him to give him an opportunity to be obedient and to receive a gift from God. Now, notice in verses 4 through 6 that Cornelius is not offered anything except the call. He's receiving, receiving something may be implied because God noticed your generosity, but it never says he's going to get anything out of this. He's basically asked to do something, and he responds in obedience. He does know God is pleased based on what the angel said, so that's... That makes it easier to be obedient when you know you're doing it for somebody who's happy with you. All right. The angel only says, do what I tell you, and then do what the man I'm sending you to tells you to do. So he's basically getting orders. Cornelius is one who understands authority, and he responds to this authority with obedience. Cornelius now, if you understand this, knows that he's not going to be somebody well received by the Jew he's being sent to. He's a Roman and they are pretty much universally hated. People will work with them, but they don't want them there. So he's actually being sent to go get this guy and bring him to his house and he has no reason to expect other than God said do it, that that will happen. And there's a risk involved. He's taking a risk doing this. Now, if any of us encountered an angel, we would likely be blindly obedient just out of fear, if nothing else. But however ill-advised Ill the order may seem, if an angel's telling you to do it, I suspect most of us would do it. But so Cornelius, being human, does immediately respond to the authority, and he sends faithful servants to do what was asked. He sends guys he can trust to make sure it happens. Cornelius is living in Caesarea Maritima, which is on the coast, and that's a city that was built by Rome. And it's also a port, and it's the seat where King Herod reigns from, and it's also where the Roman government and governor are. So this is where he is. He's being sent to what is now Joppa, and that is also on the Mediterranean. It's also a natural port, and it's about 20 miles to the south of where he is. Ah, thank you for the water. Now, in those days, 20 miles would normally be about a two days journey. And now we want to read about the other end of the trip, verses 9 through 15, and see what's happening where Peter is in Joppa. The next day, and this is 9 through 15 again, sorry. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop house to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten. I lost it. Anything common or unclean. <coughs> Excuse me. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times. 
And the object was taken up into heaven again. Okay, we are 21 hours later than when Cornelius met his angel. And Peter is starting to pray. And we, we can see the servants and the soldier that were sent made really good time in what normally would be a two-day journey. They did it in less than a day. And that included their preparation for the trip, which there would have been some of that since it would be at least a night or two away from home. So they, were, they showed expedient obedience. They moved quickly when they were told what to do. Here we are with Peter, and he's our disciple who was radically changed when Jesus returned and forgave him for his denial. Peter, who once would boldly, if not wisely, argue with Jesus about not doing this or doing that, uh, was radically changed as Jesus, at Jesus' death to this new, godly, obedient servant. And yeah, I'm being a little sarcastic because when we look at Peter here, he, he looks kind of familiar. He's indeed radically changed as we all are when we accept Jesus as our Savior. But we still are burdened with the same flesh the same temptations, same weaknesses, and the same character flaws. Now, God provides us with all the tools that we need to respond appropriately, but we still need to make the right decision and by willpower and not by reason and emotion, but by the strength that he gives us in being obedient. And Peter, God bless him, uh, needs three times to see this dream. Does that number three sound familiar to anybody regarding Peter? That's how many times Jesus asked if he loved him. It was you know, how many times that he denied him. So that seems to be his number, and he got it after three of them. Peter is a good practicing Jew, and he has never eaten the food that has been offered to him in this sheet even though it was offered from heaven, it is still unlawful in Jesus' mind. I mean, Jesus', sorry, in Peter's mind. And we often see in, the, in this passage, we'll see an example of freedom from the law, and you'll hear that preached a lot using this as the, the text, so that we are no longer bound to the law, but we are under the new commandment of Jesus Christ to love God, love others. So it's interesting to note that he is already breaking the law by staying at Simon the Tanner's house. The Tanner is what tells us that because any interaction with dead bodies makes you unclean and with blood and you're not going to be in a Tanner's house without being, you know, subjected to blood and bodies. So he is likely to be ceremonial unclean, ceremonially unclean, but he is still concerned about breaking the eating laws. He's getting free, but he's not there yet. Okay. And we also want to, and this might be one of the most important things, to look at what's happened in this first part of the scripture. God is preparing both men for this encounter. And if he hadn't done both, it wouldn't have happened. He is the, I like to think of God as a master chess player. And he's moving all the pieces in a way that gets things done, even though we've got an enemy player trying to mess with his strategy, it will never work because he is a master. He is the master. But he is using the circumstances with both of these to bring them together to, for a purpose that God intends. Without his action and attention to get a positive, positive response in both men, they never would have come together on this. The Hebrews, as we 
point out before, feared and despised the Romans. And the Romans had disdain for the Jews and for their customs, customs that made ruling them much more difficult. And they were, this was not a popular post for a Roman to get sent to because of their difficulties. Basically, they were enemies. All right, let's read the rest of tonight's text, verses 17 through 23. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Kind of cool timing there. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion a just man, who, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now, Peter is sitting wondering about why... He is supposed to eat unclean food, and the Holy Spirit leads him to the answer. And again, it's in God's timing, and it's perfect timing. They're asking at the gate as he's being told to let these three men in. Peter knows that there are going to be three men coming, and they arrive. And so with confidence, and you know, if nothing Peter has never lacked confidence, lacked confidence but here he has it and he knows that he's approved of God which makes it that much better but he does take control of this conversation it looks like to me from reading it so confidently he, and that it like I said is a nature he knows he's doing God's will and Peter agrees to go with the men and invites them in they're given Jewish hospitality, which is something that would have been most unlikely in this situation, even though it's lawful. I mean, you're supposed to welcome in strangers, but wel welcoming in Romans in the context of that time likely wasn't a popular thing. But he had them in, and they were treated well, and they leave the next day. And that is an in obedience, and it's with faith in God on all counts. Okay, next week we're going to discuss the outcome of their obedience, but tonight I wanted to review a, a few of the things we've looked at, and I didn't really call them life lessons, but I guess we can. But these are statements that I got out of this, and then we'll discuss anything that you might have seen in there. First thing is God is pleased by our generosity, by our prayers, which is when we're spending time with him, and our obedience. And that many times is said in the Bible that we show our love for God through obedience. And the next thing is when we have an encounter with God, it requires obedience. It requires action in faith. And it will almost always, I started to say always, but I hate absolutes, but I think I can say it will always take us out of our comfort zone when we're responding to God in faith. Another thing that I saw in here is that our, our nature and our personality and our understanding of the situation and also our legalism are often roadblock blocks to being obedient. We have to get over, you know, the way we see the situation. We have to get over our personal biases and our, you know, like, 
Peter did, his trust issues. And we have to overcome those roadblocks to be obedient. And then, but God will always provide us what we need to get around these through faith and willpower. He will always give us what we need to overcome our obstacles. And then another one, God arranges circumstances to enable our obedience. And that was sort of a, he's going to set us up, not for failure, but for success. But we have to respond to it. All righty. One of the things I'd like you to think about, and then we'll, I don't know, we, we're a small enough group, we can just do it this way, although I will be sitting as soon as I say this. <laughs> but uh, well, actually, we've got elders and deacons galore in here today, don't we? But we'll, we'll do one big small group. But think of a time that you have unmistakably heard from God. And think about in what ways obedience caused a crisis, and I'm stealing rather li liberally from Henry Blackaby, what he calls a crisis of belief. But it is a, a you know, this is, I can't do this reaction to what you've just heard God say to do. And one of the lovely things about that, and this is something I tell people regularly, if you see a way you can accomplish what God told you to do, it's probably not God telling you to do it. He's going to ask us to do the impossible and require us to step out in faith to do that, or what seems impossible to us. So in what ways uh, did you face that crisis, and what was the outcome of your obedience? Or if you're really brave, what was your outcome of your disobedience if you didn't do it when you were called? <laughs>